like, yeah, we can. <laughs> The Monerotopia Price Report segment is sponsored by Local Monero. Avoid using KYC exchanges. Buy and sell Monero directly for fiat, peer to peer. Body. Hey, what's up, guys? Me? Yeah, I can hear you. Hey, great. I think, um, I, think I bet they've got like a button on their soundboard or something that's just like that mutes the their incoming. Probably. How are you doing? Good, man. How about yourself? Doing all right. It's been a uh... A little, little bit of price action this week. What do you think? Yeah, it, it was a little bit more boring this week than um, weeks previously. Kind of, uh, it looks like things want to take a break, maybe consolidate. Um, I, I still think the charts look optimistic, but there's um, there's some interesting artifacts that look similar to what we've seen earlier this year. Um, I think there's a good chance that Bitcoin could could probably reach for 40k, 45k. I'm not convinced it can go much further than that, but um, you know, we we can get into all that here pretty quickly. Um, I'll try and keep it short today. I, I know that a lot of other stuff is going on. So um, right here, we're looking at the Monero price and, you know, stable coin as always. I was actually just right now. Oh, one thing. Um, make sure that you change your your resolution on YouTube um, to 1080p if you want these charts to be clear. Sometimes YouTube will downgrade you to like 420p and everything will be totally fuzzy. So, um, yeah, with that in mind, uh, and if you have any questions for me, um, just shoot them out on YouTube. So um, today, yeah, I was kind of musing on the fact that Early this year, like in January, was the highest U.S. dollar price that Monero has had like all year long, which is, um, you know, it's kind of weird. You would think with all the broad positivity that's happened in crypto sense that uh, that maybe we could have broken that January high. It, it's funny because it does seem like that's just the pattern that we see um, before a big broad movement. You'll see Monero pump to the upside. Um, and then and then like a bull market for the rest of the crypto market will happen. And um, <coughs> excuse me. So you can basically see that happened here. This is the XMR BTC chart. This was our infamous fall pump of 2020, and um, and then that precipitated our ratio decline. But that was you know a pretty large bull market that happened, um, especially for altcoins in, in particular. Um, so, and then again, we had the same thing happen here during the bull market: Monero versus Bitcoin, uh, Monero dominance climbing, Monero price doing relatively good coming to this peak up here, almost breaking the um, the 1% of Bitcoin's market cap. And then uh, and then we had this big, broad, positive movement across crypto for basically the entire year. Um, but Monero basically gets all its gains right up front. Um, and, you know, we've talked about this before. I don't think that's an accident. I think they treat Monero and gold very similarly, which also raises an eyebrow for me about who's really kind of um, pulling these price strings behind the scenes in the crypto ecosystem. Um, I, I do think there's significant influence. And the fact that they treat Monero similarly to gold, because we'll see this with gold. We'll see where gold will pump early on in the cycle, just as a bull market is maybe about to start, just as like the, the demand destroying event, the crash happens, you'll get a big pump on gold early on that will then fizzle out as the rest of the markets continue to run. And I think that that's done to keep the sort of psychological focus off of gold, off of Monero. Um, because they really, you know, the 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 insiders really make a lot more money on stocks. They make a lot more money on shit coins. Oh, but anyways, so we've got Monero here being our wonderful little stable coin, um, just hanging out. Uh, if the if the markets continue to be positive, expect this to to basically continue to the upside. We could try and draw kind of a, a little bit of a trend line there. You might try and kind of call this a rising wedge, but I. I would say that that's that would be a highly dubious thing to call here. At a minimum, we've got this uh, this support line going on. Um, we saw some interesting things with the divergences happen recently. It seems that OKX is like the new player in town. Um, we're not seeing nearly as much uh, volume on Binance, uh, or at least price divergence volume on Binance, but we are seeing a lot of it on OKX. So um, yeah, you know I. I raise an eyebrow at some of this stuff and and how this happens, but you know wh whatever. Um, we've, we've grown accustomed to it. Uh, one thing sh we should check out here with Monero also is the um, the big the big time frame head and shoulders that um, is actually still in play despite the breakdown. Um, so because this is such a broad structure, we have a lot of latitude with how we can how we can draw it. So effectively, this being the left shoulder, that being the head, and then this can still end up being a right shoulder. Like that's totally possible. This can still end up playing out as a head and shoulders. Now, if things continue down here, they bump up and then we kind of take a dip, that's going to basically invalidate this structure. Essentially getting back to this line that I just drew, this bottom yellow line, that effectively invalidates um, the head and shoulders structure. 
usually these things play out. And as we talked about, like we really needed to break this area. We needed Monero to bump up to the top side here and basically confirm a break of that line. And that would have been the final confirmation of the head and shoulders. Um, so really for the past few months, we've been talking about the structure and it's saying that, Hey, um, Technically, this is not yet a head and shoulders, but it has a significant potential to do that. But we need to see that break. Well, unfortunately, as of the past few weeks, that hasn't happened. The pattern is not invalidated, but um, but obviously that's that's the wrong direction, right? We want to see it go the other direction to, to really think that this pattern is in play. Um, so we can also take a look at the broader markets. Let's go ahead and take a look at Bitcoin plus Ethereum market caps. Um, and you'll notice that, again, very long term. Uh, time frames here, we've got the wave magic turned on. The blue lines are the upper standard deviations, really moving standard deviations, just like you have a moving average. You can have a moving standard deviation. If you don't know what it is, ask ChatGPT. It's actually a fairly simple concept. It's just a measure of central tendency. If you have a very volatile data set, your standard deviations are going to be large. And if your data set is really narrow and it doesn't have hardly any volatility, then your standard deviation is going to be low, right? It means that everything is closely centered to the mean, to the average. Um, so these are useful because um, humans are like statistical processing machines, especially in aggregate. So this gives us kind of levels that humans are like the market psychology is looking at. You're, you're kind of looking at a psychology map here. This is one of the reasons why I think that it's very possible that... Um, that we could continue to see Bitcoin run a natural, a very natural target here would be these upper standard deviation levels, which would put things, let's go to the measurement tool, if it'll work. That'll put us about 25% higher than where we currently are um, for the Bitcoin and Ethereum combined market caps. Um, and where Bitcoin and Ethereum go, so will the rest of the market likely go. Right now, things are kind of hanging out at this, um, at this very long uh, uh, trend line right here that we kind of drew from connecting that point and that point. Um, and really, it's kind of like, it's sort of like the most shallow way you could possibly draw the line. It might be considered slightly dubious, but um, it, it might be useful right here. We've kind of bumped above it. If this thing holds, getting back into this zone really sets you up to, uh, to continue making some gains, but, but we really need to get above this big line right here. So that's one way of looking at it, right? Combine Ethereum and Bitcoin at the same time. We can also take a look at solely the Bitcoin chart. And this is where I kind of wanted to um, talk about that artifact that, um, that I mentioned earlier. So what I want you guys to notice is that is let's start by taking a look at this line right here. Um, you know what? We'll, we'll also turn off the wave magic because I'm getting some delay. I always get delay on the charts because these standard deviation lines, there's like 600 lines printed on this chart technically and a filter being run. So again, this is kind of like the target area. I keep saying 45,000 ish because that's kind of like where you would maybe hope to expect to make before, um, you know, getting some kind of pullback um, and then making some kind of very long consolidation on the months long time frame before breaking to the upside. Um, <clears throat> there are There are things that could sort of invalidate that um, as far as like in the macro sense. <clears throat> so, um, in, in the macro sense, if we continue to see the treasury, like taking out a trillion and $2 trillion every few months, that's going to put significant liquidity into the market. That's going to put significant inflation into the market. And that could actually, that could be like sort of an outside macro event that causes price to continue rising in a way that you wouldn't expect the chart to, and that typically things haven't behaved. Typically, after you make it up to these big standard deviations, you need to consolidate. It takes months. Um, but if we get some kind of like, if we see the global net liquidity and the Fed, the US net liquidity rising, and we continue to see the fall, sorry, a little bit all over the place here. If we continue to see, for example, this reverse repo uh, falling, that means that, um, so this chart right here, that's about a trillion dollars. That's another trillion dollars that's just sitting there doing nothing, getting a little bit of interest rate, like around 5%. If that thing comes back down to zero, that's a whole other trillion dollars that could be going into risk assets effectively. So um, back to the BTC chart, we're going to clear all of those colorful lines, and we're just going to take a look at this. Okay, so I want to focus right here on this line, this line right here. You'll notice that we broke above that line and then came back down below it. And there's actually a number of different ways that you could draw lines on these charts and say, okay, we broke above, it kept looking like we were breaking above, and uh, and then it fell back down. And right now on the short time frame, on the Bitcoin short time frame, that's kind of what we're seeing. Like 
it was, this is a very, very clear structure to draw, right? We got this uh, support line right there. We've got kind of this resistance line on the close, the, the four hour close prices. And then you can, uh, you can draw the other line up here as a parallel line um, that tops out at those wicks. And that makes sense to do, right? Just from like a basic pub line charting perspective, this is, this is how you would draw this chart. Like this is abundantly clear. So what we get is like this break right here, a quick fake breakdown, like a little wick to the downside. And then it looks like, oh, we're establishing support. This is awesome. And then crash crash to the support and then pump to the upside to look like we're going to break it again only to crash back down below into the channel this is just fuckery like i'm sorry but but it's fuckery and it's it's got that same kind of like signature it's got that same kind of artifact where it's like you get these fake breaks these like hopium breaks above the rising resistance because everyone kind of they everyone even if they don't officially like on the top side of their consciousness know they at least intuitively feel like when you break rising resistance to the upside, that's inherently bullish. And that is typically what happens in a bull market. So everyone's looking at these rising resistance lines thinking, yeah, we just broke that to the upside. The bull is back on. This, I think, is insiders effectively playing with psychology to wreck traders effectively. So again, this is a good reason why it's like you generally want to avoid trading. You want to reallocate assets. Um, getting in early, you know, or sorry, late last year and early this year, that was a good opportunity. If you're the hodler kind of persuasion to get in the market and just stay in the market. Um, if you're kind of a mid to long-term trader, which is a little bit closer to my style, um, you know, you're going to take some extra risk on, on some of these areas right here. Cause it's hard to know. It's hard to know. Is this a real break? One of these times it's going to be a real break and that's actually going to happen. But, um, is it going to be this time? I don't know. I don't like that. We had these fake breaks on the short time frames, but, um, that's not necessarily like preclusive in any kind of way to say that, uh, to say that this run is over, this could very easily just be consolidation. Those, um, those ETF rumors. Cause, uh, those ETF rumors were, which I guess they were just rumors because recently a spokesperson for BlackRock came out and were like, no, we're not signing an ETF. That's partially what made that uh, that bump happen, right? Oh, interesting. Um, yeah, maybe maybe there were some events there. I guess I haven't been paying quite enough attention to um, to like the uh, the news cycle the past week. Um, I did. I think I do remember seeing that that someone in BlackRock came out. Yeah, and they were kind of negative on the ETF. Um, so my thinking on this is that, yes, a big part of this pump was the ETF um, kind of hype and hopium. It People are thinking, like there were some BlackRock people that said they expect by January 10th it'll be approved. And then some other BlackRock guy comes out and says, well, you know, actually maybe not. So, you know, this could be a lot. This could be insider, like just jacking the markets around that. That very well could be that. I think overall, like in the broader picture, is the ETF going to get approved? Yes. Um, the problem is that the SEC approved the futures ETF. So like, basically it's weird. Like what they did is they approved an ETF in 2021 based on the Chicago mercantile exchange futures market. Right. So when in 2017, when they listed Bitcoin on the CME, that was the literal day of the top December 17th, 2017. Um, and then basically at the literal entire week of the top in 2021, the SEC approved the futures ETF. Um, and that futures ETF price is based on the uh, the CME, not on the actual Bitcoin spot price. So they're trying to get ETFs that are like literally directly spot ownership of Bitcoin, ETFs that buy and sell Bitcoin to maintain the assets correctly. Um, and so it's it's like this massive double standard for them to have approved the futures ETF, but not the spot ETF. They keep denying it. It's weird because it's the same SEC. It's the same Gensler. It's the same freaking Biden administration. So it's like, why did they approve one but not the other? And now the courts are saying like, hey, that's like arbitrary and capricious. And you guys need to you guys need to reevaluate your decision here. Like this was uh, that was kind of, they kind of without saying is without saying as much. They said that was the wrong decision. So eventually it's going to get approved or they're going to have to like rescind the futures ETF, but that's probably not going to happen because why would they, right? And BlackRock's involved now. So, I mean, it's just like, it's on Fidelity, it's on BlackRock, it's on the CME. It's it, There's an ETF in many other countries, like it's going to get approved. Will that be by January 10th? I don't know. Um, but yeah, you're probably right. There probably was a little bit of that, that, uh, that jacks the market around that kind of like some of that price volatility that, that would make sense. Um, so thanks for, thanks for pointing that out. Um, Let's see, take a look at Bitcoin dominance here. It's kind of like in this triangle after this like kind of fake breakout. Bitcoin dominance does this from time to time. Um, we saw that actually with the last bull market that, um, let's turn off the wave magic. It's too slow. So we saw that actually in the last bull market where um, Bitcoin dominance like just took this massive spike. If you all remember in uh, like November, December of 2020, that was like Bitcoin breaking out in a way that um, didn't really make sense. Uh, 
and then uh, and then just came right back down. So I mean, it does that sometimes. It's kind of fake out. I I personally don't think that, despite the claims of um, many Bitcoiners, I don't expect that this chart is ever going to go back up to uh, to these kind of levels up here in the 60, 70 percent. That was a special time, and that's just it's it's over. That time is over. It's it's just probably not going to happen, um, especially because the spotlight has to be shared with ETH at this point, and that ETF will also get approved eventually. Um, we'll take a quick look at the macro, and then we'll call it a day. So uh, Dixie has broken down from what looked like a bullish flag. So all bets are off on Dixie now. Um, that has been correlated with um, reasonably good performance in the NASDAQ. So if we go here to the NASDAQ, um, effectively, NASDAQ is now back at, all, at not all time, sorry, excuse me. NASDAQ is back, back at its local annual highs that it set in June, uh, sorry, July of this year. So that's acting as resistance right now. It would be pretty irresponsible of markets and the Fed and everybody involved um, to see this thing just go to the top side. That spells more inflation. However, um, I'm not so sure if there's much the Fed can do about it. They're backed into a rock and a hard place at this moment. Can they raise rates anymore without like totally tanking the economy and creating like massive dis demand destroying events and like just screwing up like every market out there? I don't know if they can raise rates much more. They probably have a little bit more in the tank, but um, they probably don't have much more. And markets are just frothy and optimistic at this moment. So um, at the moment, you would look at this chart. You would say that this is long-term bullish. Of course, we're looking at the NASDAQ. So that's like, it's basically always long-term bullish. They always print money. But right now you would say, okay, locally, near term, this might kind of take a moment, maybe get a fake out here. In fact, a fake out to the upside, a wick to the upside to come back down. And then like check out some kind of support down here. Um, that would be really bullish, and that would be like game on. So if you'll notice those uh, very dubious yellow lines I have drawn, take us into next year. We're actually getting pretty close to the end of the year. It might make some sense um, with the markets having gone this far. We might see a muted January effect. We might see a muted um, tax harvesting effect this year. People have gains. They don't want to harvest those gains. Um, that means they'll have to pay taxes this year. And who wants to pay taxes? Never. Nobody. Um, so we probably like the effect that we saw last year where everybody was down. People were realizing their losses and writing them off on taxes. Uh, that's probably not in play this year. It's probably not going to happen exactly that way this year. Maybe a little bit. Who knows? Um, people do have losers. And if people have losers, they'll cut those. So there could be some isolated events of that. But overall, in terms of like the broad market, um, I wouldn't expect that to happen. So just um, just for those of you out there that might be considering that um, and trying to sort of duplicate what happened last year onto this year, the macro environment wouldn't really support that. So um, yeah, just be aware of that. Oh, uh, let's see. Let's Let's take a quick look at oil. If the chart will come up, there we go. Um, so yeah, we've looked at this chart for a really long time. Um, we've we've been saying for a really long time that we we really like to stay in this channel would be good. To break down from this channel would be better um, because that helps to keep inflation down. And what do we all want? Low inflation and plus mad gains, right? That's what everybody wants. So um, oil uh, found its resistance here. We talked a little bit about this, that that's like a good spot to look for resistance. Um, luckily, it did find it, and it's kind of coming back down. Um, and luckily, this time, it's not driven by the emptying of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve because they actually uh, already emptied that. So I don't know exactly how they did this. It sounded like OPEC and the, the oil nations were going to try and cut production. Um, but anyhow, oil did make it back down, and it's broken down here. So... Um, you know, I would really expect this to just kind of like trend in this area right here. So that's, that's good. Like we don't want to see high energy prices. Um, yes, the government fakes the GPI numbers. This is something we know that they do and they keep changing it. Um, shadow stats is a way to really understand better what the, what the inflation numbers really are looking like. Um, but in terms of like the broad economy, it's kind of like if you push the lie hard enough and big enough, enough people believe it to sort of make it half true sometimes. So that's, that's a little bit of, uh, what's going on there. Um, nothing to see here in terms of the yield curve inversion. It's basically just the same thing. Everything's flattened out. Um, you know, this is a long-term signal. I wouldn't expect this to change for the next few months. We might not even look at it too much anymore unless there's, unless something really happens, unless there's, there's something really to talk about. Um, you know, I had a friend, um, the last thing we'll, we'll leave out on here is the single family home prices. I had a friend that's, um, he was trying to sell his house and it was like, he got in like just a couple months too late to take advantage of the spring bounce last year. So he's waiting, trying to get a higher price. And he's asking me like, Hey, should I lower my price or should I, should I wait till next year? And I said, well, obviously I'm not a financial advisor. So what the fuck do I know? I'm just a dude. Um, drawing. Wow. Really? You're charts. not unbelievable. <laughs> I'm your official unofficial Monero, uh, 
terrorist financial advisor. No, not even that. Anyways, so you'll notice the sawtooth right here. Usually uh, wintertime is not the time that homes are sold. Um, and especially with the rates the way they are, like you're going to have a hard time selling your house. But you're only a few short months um, from when the bump typically happens, which is like February, March, April. That's when prices start going back up. Single family homes start getting fetching a higher price. You start seeing more volume. Um, people hopefully have started to make some adjustments in their finances when it comes to um, like rates. And so they might be able to actually finance, refinance, do stuff like that. So if you have a home, like um, I, I don't think we're going to see necessarily a demand destroying event happen in the next few months. So you might just hold out here um, till early next year um, to, to, to sell your house. So uh, yeah, I think that's about it. I think I've rambled on long enough for one day. So. Cheers. Happy Friday, everybody.